Good morning, and welcome to Whirlpool Corporation's third quarter 2022 earnings release call. Today's call is being recorded. For opening remarks and introductions, I would like to turn the call over to Senior Director of Investor Relations, Corey Thomas. Thank you, and welcome to our fourth quarter and full year 2022 conference call. Joining me today are Mark Bitzer, our Chairman and Chief Executive Officer, and Jim Peters, our Chief Financial Officer. Our remarks today track with a presentation available on the investor section of our website at whirlpoolcorp.com. Before we begin, I want to remind you that as we conduct this call, we'll be making forward-looking statements to assist you in better understanding Whirlpool Corporation's future expectations. Our actual results could differ materially from these statements due to many factors discussed in our latest 10K, 10Q, and other periodic reports. We also want to remind you that today's presentation includes non-GAAP measures. We believe these measures are important indicators of our operations as they exclude items that may not be indicative of results from our ongoing business operations. We also think the adjusted measures will provide you with a better baseline for analyzing trends in our ongoing business operations. Listeners are directed to the presentation and supplemental information package posted on the Investor Relations section of our website for the reconciliation of non-GAAP items to the most directly comparable GAAP measures. At this time, all participants are in a listen-only mode. Following our prepared remarks, the call will be open for analyst questions. As a reminder, we ask that participants ask no more than two questions. With that, I'll turn the call over to Mark. Thanks, Corey, and good morning, everyone. Turning to our agenda on slide four, I will preview what we will discuss today. Two weeks ago, we announced the conclusion of a strategic review of EMEA alongside preliminary 2022 results and a preview of our 23 expectations. This morning, we will provide additional context on each, starting with our 22 results. And during the second half of 2022, we were in the midst of an unfavorable macro cycle, where short-term consumer sentiment and demand continue to reflect recessionary concerns. At the same time, inflationary pressures remain stubbornly high. While the combination of demand down, cost up, is historically rather unusual or at best temporary, it did impact our results negatively during Q4. In addition, our supply chain execution was not where we expected it to be in the fourth quarter. This was due to a one-off supplier issue that has since been resolved, but negatively impacted a number of our North American factories. Jim will provide more information on 2022 later in the call. Looking ahead into 2023, we do expect the tail end of its negative macro cycle to be felt during the first few months of the year. We foresee macro headwinds to slowly turn into tailwinds as the year progresses. Needless to say that it is difficult to predict the exact timing of a shift in the macro cycle, but we would expect this to happen towards late Q2 or early Q3. Given this volatility, we remain relentlessly focused on the business levers which we can control. And we are fully confident that the medium-term demand drivers of our business remain intact. Our operational priorities in 2023 will be flawless execution of our supply chain and the delivery of very significant cost targets. After two years of inflationary cost increases, we will deliver $800 to $900 million of total cost takeout. We have a high degree of confidence in delivering this target. Looking back on our history, Whirlpool has a strong record of successfully managing for challenging cycles and delivering substantial cost reductions. In 2007, we expected 400 million of raw material inflation as we entered the year. We responded to this high level of cost inflation with early and decisive actions, delivering record results. In 2011 and 2012, we reduced our fixed costs in North America by more than $400 million. More importantly, we're not just starting this new cost initiative in January 2023. As mentioned in our prior earnings calls, we have initiated this during the second half of 2022. As a result, the maturity of the underlying actions has advanced significantly, thus giving us a high degree of confidence in the delivery of cost targets. Now, turning to slide five, I will provide an update on our strategic review of EMEA and our portfolio transformation. I am very happy with the EMEA transaction, its value creation, 
and how it fits into the broader context of Whirlpool's portfolio transformation that we have been discussing. In April of 2022, we outlined how we would continue our multi-year journey of transforming Whirlpool into a high growth, high margin business. Let me first remind you why we are transforming our portfolio. As we sit here today, we are operating in a very different world than we were just 10 or 20 years ago. It is a less global world. Global scale was significant in the past, but we're now experiencing diminishing advantages of that. The benefits from regional and local scale have become even more apparent and compelling. At the same time, Wopu has raised the bar for long-term value creation. It is with this mindset that we critically assess ourselves, and we are focused on transforming our portfolio into a high-margin, high-growth business. Recent actions include adding and syncorator to our already strong brand portfolio and agreeing to contribute our European major domestic appliance business into a newly formed entity with Arcelic. As you can see, the portfolio transformation is ongoing and we have made significant progress. I'm confident these actions have us well positioned to delivering growing shareholder value over time. As a reminder, as a result of our transactions we executed in 2022, we will see an increase in free cash flow of approximately $350 million in 2024. Now turning to slide six, I will share more about the strategic review of our EMEA business. We assessed a range of options with the goal of maximizing value for our shareholders, employees, and consumers. We are pleased with the outcome of an agreement to contribute our European major domestic appliance business to a newly formed European appliance entity with Arslik. Arslik is a company that we know well, having executed a number of transactions with them. Our consumers will benefit from broad product and service offerings as we bring together the best of the best innovation, attractive brands, and sustainable manufacturing. We will own approximately 25% of a new company, and we expect the transaction to close during the second half of 2023, subject to regulatory approvals. The new company is expected to have over 6 billion euro of annual sales with over 200 million euro of cost synergies. It is important to note that we're retaining our ownership of our EMEA KitchenAid business. Our global KitchenAid small appliance business is one of the three strong pillars of our value creating business model with a structurally attractive margin profile. Turning to slide seven, I will discuss our value creation expectations from the actions we have taken in the EMEA region. We expect to participate in the significant efficiency the new company will generate, including sustained productivity, building upon already established purchasing capabilities, and continued commitment to product design, innovation, and sustainability. We have a potential to unlock long-term value creation through our ability to monetize our minority interest at an estimated net present value of $500 million. Even though we envision a long-term profitable relationship with Arslik, the shareholder agreement includes a number of exit options at predetermined parameters after five years. Our 40 year Whirlpool brand licensing agreement will generate predictable cash flows of more than $20 million per year. Overall, we expect $750 million net present value of future cash flows. Separately, through the previously executed divestiture, of our Russia business, we continue to expect up to $260 million of deferred payments. Now I'll turn it over to Jim to review our fourth quarter results. Thanks, Mark, and good morning, everyone. Turning to slide nine, our fourth quarter performance was impacted by a one-off supply chain disruption in North America and elevated cost inflation. Despite this, I want to highlight that our previously initiated cost actions remained on track. Additionally, raw material costs remain elevated, but we are beginning to see improvement. In the fourth quarter, we delivered ongoing EPS of $3.89 and ongoing margins of 3.5%, as results benefited from a full year adjusted effective tax rate of 4%. Turning to slide 10, I'll review results for our North America region. As expected, the inflationary environment and increasing interest rates continue to weigh on demand, and cost-based pricing actions partially offset elevated cost inflation. Our production volumes were impacted by approximately 5% due to a one-off 
supply chain disruption as mentioned before. This disruption involved one critical supplier providing a common platform of parts for multiple manufacturing locations and products and was resolved in mid-January. This disruption also negatively impacted price mix as we had previously committed investments in anticipation of value creating holiday promotions. Given the confidential nature of the ongoing discussions with the supplier, we will not share any additional information about this situation. Even with the supply challenges faced in the quarter, we successfully maintained our recent sequential quarterly share gains. We are confident that the actions we put in place have us positioned to win, and we remain confident in the structural strength of our North America business. Turning to slide 11, I'll review our results for our Europe, Middle East, and Africa region. Excluding the impact of foreign currency and the divested Whirlpool Russia business, fourth quarter revenue was down approximately 9%. The region delivered break-even EBIT margins during the quarter as cost-based pricing actions offset lower volumes and cost inflation. And as Mark mentioned, we completed our strategic review of EMEA. Until the close of the transaction, EMEA's performance will continue to be included in our ongoing results. Turning to slide 12, I'll review results for our Latin America region. The region saw demand declines that were moderate compared to the steep declines experienced during the third quarter. The region's cost-based pricing and strong cost actions resulted in flat revenue and solid EBIT margins for the quarter. Turning to slide 13, I'll review results for our Asia region. On a full year basis, excluding the China business and the impact of foreign currency, revenue grew by approximately 5%. Cost-based pricing actions were more than offset by weaker demand and continued cost inflation, resulting in an EBIT margin of 2.7%. Now I'll turn it over to Mark to discuss our perspective on 2023. Thanks, Jim. Turning to slide 15, I will share how we expect the current operating environment, marked by softer demand and still elevated but easing costs, to impact 2023. As we enter the new year, we continue to expect consumer sentiment to negatively impact demand. This is expected to be more pronounced at the beginning of the year, the first half demand to be down by five to 10%. And we expect demand will improve each quarter and to exit 2023 with flat industry volumes. We strongly believe in the favorable mid and long-term demand tailwinds, in particular in North America. The undersupplied aging housing stock is the oldest it has ever been, and we expect this will drive new construction demand in the mid to long term. In the short term, the sharp increase in mortgage rates has suppressed existing home sales. But consumer equity remains very strong. As a result, we do expect a sustained high level of remodeling activities in the home and the kitchen in particular. Putting it differently, in the short term, consumers may be reluctant to buy a new house, but they will use their strong balance sheet to remodel their home. From a go-to-market perspective, we expect 2023 promotional activity to be at similar levels as the second half of 2022. Also looking to the second half of 2023, we continue to expect the promotion environment to remain below pre-pandemic levels. From a raw materials perspective, we see raw material costs easing throughout the year. Steel spot rates have come down significantly, and we have started seeing the benefits of this in our annual contracts. We also see improvements in resins, and ocean freight. At the same time, there are still a number of commodities such as nickel and strategic components where we are faced with persistent high cost levels. Turning to slide 16, our 2023 operational priorities are clear. First, we aim for flawless execution of our supply chain. Now, let me start out by stating a flawless execution is easier said than done. Our supply chain model has served us very well over many decades but it is a cost efficiency driven supply chain model characterized by long transportation lanes from low cost countries, a high degree of parts complexity and a high percentage of single sourcing. This historic supply chain model is cost efficient, but has not been resilient enough to cope with the unprecedented COVID related volatility and disruptions. Over the past two years, we have reduced our parts complexity from well over 110,000 active parts to slightly more than 70,000 active parts. 
In the midterm, we do see a path to drive this number to well below 50,000 parts. At the same time, we significantly expanded our dual sourcing from single sourcing. We put our priority on high value strategic parts and components and have come a long way in de-risking this part of our supply chain. But we still have a tail end of lower value parts that are single sourced. This will be our focus in the coming months and years. As mentioned before, our second operation priority is a cost reduction of 800 to 900 million dollars. We expect to deliver 500 million in net cost takeout actions by removing over 250 million dollars of premium costs and inefficiencies from our supply chain operations and continuing to be disciplined in our discretionary spending and headcount management. Compared to the summer of 2022, our current global salary workforce is already down by 4%, and we will remain very disciplined throughout 2023. In addition to these net cost takeout actions, we do expect 300 to $400 million in raw material cost reductions, adding up to the 800 to $900 million total cost target. As you look at the seasonality of this cost reduction, you will note that it is more skewed towards the second half of 2023. There are three factors explaining the seasonality, which specifically impact Q1. First, it's important to remember that we have higher cost inventory as we enter 2023, creating a lagging effect of easing raw materials. Putting it differently, even though costs are coming down because of inventory, it normally takes about two months to see this fully reflected in our P&L. Second, we're lapping tiers of lower year-over-year -year inflation as cost increases peak in the third quarter of 2022. Third, as you may recall, we have a variety of material contract lengths with quarterly and annual durations, which create somewhat of a lag. Now, with many of our annual contract negotiations now complete, we have line of sight to deliver three to $400 million of raw material cost benefit in 2023. Now I'll turn it over to Jim to discuss our full year 2023 guidance on slide 17. Thanks, Mark. I'll review our full year 2023 guidance. In 2023, we expect a revenue decline of one to 2% given softer consumer demand and sentiment, most notably in North America and EMEA, especially as the first half of 2023 continues to reflect the current macro cycles. As we reset our cost structure, we expect to expand ongoing EBIT margins to approximately 7.5% and deliver approximately $800 million in free cash flow. Our free cash flow delivery could be significantly impacted by the timing of the close of the EMEA transaction alongside the seasonality of cash generation from the region. We expect our ongoing tax rate to be 14 to 16% and our interest cost to be approximately $325 million, which reflects the incremental debt from the Insincorator acquisition. This represents a full year ongoing EPS range of $16 to $18. Turning to slide 18, we show the drivers of our full year ongoing EBIT margin guidance. We expect price mix to be negatively impacted by 225 basis points. As our availability improves, we expect to participate in value creating promotions partially offset by positive mix driven by a strong lineup of new product introductions. Next, as we execute $500 million of strong cost takeout actions throughout the year alongside raw material benefits, we expect a positive 425 basis point impact to margins. Continued investments in marketing and technology alongside currency headwinds are expected to negatively impact margins by 125 basis points. As we navigate temporary demand declines, an easing inflationary environment, and execute our decisive cost takeout actions, we expect to deliver approximately 35 to 40% of our earnings in the first half of the year. We are confident that we have the right actions in place to navigate this macro environment and deliver approximately 7.5% EBIT margins. Turning to slide 19, we show our regional guidance for the year. Starting with industry demand, we expect most of our regions to continue to be impacted by a subdued demand environment, particularly during the first part of the year, as consumer sentiment is still impacted by the macro environment. In North America and EMEA, we expect a contraction of 4 to 
And in Latin America, we expect a contraction of 1% to 3%. In Asia, we expect industry to accelerate by 2 to 4%. Despite the expected declines, we expect industry volumes, particularly in North America, to be approximately 6% above 2019 levels. We expect EBIT margin expansion across all regions, driven by our strong cost takeout actions, as well as raw material inflation tailwinds. In North America, we expect to deliver full year margins of approximately 12%, with the region exiting the year with margins of approximately 14%. We expect EMEA to deliver approximately 2.5% margins. In Latin America, we expect to deliver EBIT margins of approximately 7% as cost takeout actions are partially offset by continued macroeconomic and geopolitical volatility impacting demand. Lastly, we expect EBIT margins of approximately 5.5% in Asia, driven by top line growth and strong cost takeout actions. Now turning to slide 20, I'll discuss our capital allocation priorities, which remain unchanged. We have invested over $5 billion in capital expenditures and research and development over the last five years, reflecting our commitment to deliver a high growth, high margin business. During that same time period, we have returned over $5 billion cash to shareholders, including $900 million of buybacks in 2022 and a 25% increase in our quarterly dividend, representing the 10th straight year of dividend increases and nearly the 70th consecutive year of paying dividends. The continued strength of our balance sheet with $2 billion of cash at the end of the year has given us the flexibility and optionality to pursue value creating opportunities like the acquisition of Insyncorator in 2022. In 2023, we are prioritizing debt repayment, driving an optimal capital structure and maintaining our strong investment grade credit rating. Now I'll turn the call over to Mark. Thanks, Jim. Turning to slide 21, let me close with a few remarks. In our 111-year history, we have built a proven track record of successfully operating through challenging macro cycles, and we're confident in our ability to deliver margin expansion in 2023. We will flawlessly execute on our supply chain initiatives, while our reset cost structure is expected to deliver $800 to $900 million of benefits. In addition to these actions, the ongoing portfolio transformation will unlock value and enhance our financial profile. With the addition of Integrator and the EMEA divestiture, we expect to deliver approximately $350 million of incremental free cash flow in 2024. The EMEA transaction alone is expected to deliver a 200 basis point improvement to return on investor capital, alongside a 150 basis point improvement in ongoing EBIT margin. These improvements, coupled with a healthy balance sheet, are the foundation of our firm commitment to returning cash to shareholders. Let me remind you, 2022 represents our 10th consecutive year of dividend increases with a 25% increase to our quarterly dividend. Additionally, we repurchased 900 million in shares, returning a total of $1.3 billion in cash to our shareholders. Also, in the future, we will continue to maintain a solid balance sheet by providing attractive returns to our shareholders. We are well positioned competitively, seeing favorable market share trends, and will continue to benefit from long-term demand benefits to our industry. Now, we will end our formal remarks and open it up for questions. Number one on your telephone keypad. Your first question comes from a line of David McGregor from Longbow Research. Your line is open. Yes, uh, good morning, everyone. Um, Mark, I just morning, wanted David. to morning, uh, ask you. Yeah, good morning, Jim. Good morning, Mark. Um, I guess it's sort of a two-part question. On, on slide 21, you talk about uh, get the setting yourself up for 2024. And I'm just wondering, are, are, you, are you kind of providing kind of a high-level view that by 2024 you think you can get to 11 to 12 percent ongoing EBIT margins, and, and uh, or, or is that just you feel like you can make progress towards that goal? Second part, I really just want you to comment on what happened in the fourth quarter promotionally. There's a lot of programs there. Um, you said in the past you don't expect promotional activity to revert to pre-pandemic levels. 
do you still feel this to be true? And if so, you know, what are you seeing that gives you confidence in that view and your second half price mix uh, expectations? Thank you. So, so David, let me first address the, the first question. Um, obviously, we're just giving guidance for 23, so it's a little bit too early to give a guidance for 24. Um, having said that, I think you're correct in the read that there's a lot of positive elements with, which will come through in 24. Um, first of all, um, as you heard from our prepared remarks, there's a lot of reason to believe that consumer demand, in particular U.S. housing, as it exits 23, will head into much stronger years um, because, as you know, there's a fundamentally structurally undersupplied housing market in North America, but not only in North America, which at one, po at one point will materialize. Um, so that's on the demand side. Also on the cost side, um, with the heavy lifting which we're doing now on the cost reduction, we will reset our cost base, which will set us up very well for 24. In addition, you have other elements. You have, you know, the full contribution of integrator on, on, on the margins and the cash flow. Um, and, you know, assuming that we can close the European transaction, that on its own will give an additional lift on cash flow and by definition on, on margins as you look at the total company. So with all of that in mind, um, yes, in 24, I would say we're much more confident where we're heading um, towards these long-term shareholder value creation targets, which we set out. So, and I think 24 from that perspective will be a critical proof point, and at this point, we're pretty confident towards that. So your second question related to promotion, I would say, um, David, as we observe the entire back half of 22, it was by and large pretty much as we anticipated, i.e. we expected, and we always expected a higher level of promotion to essentially a, a previous period where which was completely absent of promotion. Um, but it's still important to, to note that um, even what we saw in the back half of 22, it was quite a bit less than pre-COVID. Um, so I would call it right now, we were faced with a, a moderate promotion environment. And from what you heard from my prepared remarks, we expect a similar environment also as we look in 23. Thank you. Your next question comes from the line of Sam Darkash from Raymond James. Your line is open. Good morning, Mark. Good morning, Jim. How are you? Good morning, Sam. Um, two, two uh, I guess, themes uh, to my questions. First would be around EMEA. Um, I think normally EMEA is much more profitable seasonally in the second half than it is the first half. I'm assuming that's going to occur in 23 also. And I think it looks like you're including EMEA throughout the entirety of the year. So what's the likelihood or what's the general quantification if, it, if a transaction does close as you expect um, for incremental dilution? to EPS guidance from the absence of a profitable EMEA in the back half. And then, Mark, if you could also talk about the, the terms of the options that Arshalik has after five years. I, I didn't see it in the filings. Just trying to get a sense to, to, to ascertain the, the likelihood of, of an $800 million um, uh, transaction or a $500 million uh, PV. Thanks. Sam, let me first address the first one on the, what is in the guides and how the guides might be impacted by the closure of the transaction. Um, first of all, on, on a high level, to keep it simple, um, the timing of a transaction will probably impact the EPS to a much less extent. On the cash flow, there's more moving parts, and that's just driven by, even though historically we never show regional cash flows, but um, European cash flow throughout the year is much more volatility than the other regions, um, i.e. a pretty big cash drain and then cash bill towards the, the back end. So depending on when we close it, that has more of an impact on cash flow and a much lesser impact on EPS. On the principal profit seasonality, also keep here in mind, yes, Europe is a little bit more skewed towards Q3 and Q4, but that is largely driven by the very profitable KitchenAid small domestic appliance business, which similar to North America, has a heavy just share of Q3 and Q4 sales. So if a transaction closes, keep in mind that part of the business stays with us, so as such should not impact the EPS that much. Um, so, and that's probably also by, depending on where you potentially close it, Q3 or wh whatever, I don't expect a major impact on EPS um, from everything which we see today. Now to your second question, as it relates to the terms of a um, transaction, particular shareholder agreement, I think you will understand why we will not reveal all the details of a transaction, but let me assure you there is 
as we discussed, after five years, where multiple exit opportunities defined in the shareholder agreement, the terms, including a potential EBITDA multiple, are defined. Um, so it's pretty clear in terms of what the valuation could be. At the same time, and that's why what you see behind this 500 million, which by the way is a discounted value of the five year. But I also want to underline what I said in the earnings or in the prepared remarks is, um, you know, we have a long term potential profitable relationship in mind. But of course, as you would expect us, there are various terms of a potential exit predefined and predetermined. So there is no negotiation down the road. If I could sneak uh, another question in, um, as it relates to the RAWs, the 300 to 400 million dollar tailwind that you've identified, typically the biggest variable intra-year is oil and resins, and I'm sure that's another variable this year. But um, are there other variables such as steel that could play a role into um, the 300 to 400 million dollars being above or below that? I.e., are you having more of your steel? off contract than on contract, uh, something along those lines? So, so Sam, you successfully sneaked in a third question, <laughs> but, but anyhow, let me, let me try to address it. Um, you know, at, at this point of view, you always have a certain amount of uncertainty or of volatility in, in your forecast. Having said that, um, and you know that very well, our biggest um, procured item is steel. Steel are um, on, you know, big regions on annual contracts. And today, as, as we're sitting here, January 31st, we pretty much have closed all contracts. Now, there's one contract which technically expires in Q1, which has a little bit of lag effect. So the contractual terms, um, which, you know, as you know, this is not a hedging contract, but they're a one-year contract, um, they're defined, and that gives us a very high confidence that on the steel side, we shouldn't see major surprise. You always have a little bit of... A, a lagging item and the spot rates move, um, but again, that's a very smooth element in terms of a smooth impact on our overall PL. Resins, as you rightly point out, is are typically on quarterly contracts, so there's no annual contract, which ultimately is, I would say, loosely correlated with the oil price. So there's a little bit more moving parts on the resin side, um, but frankly, already we saw last year some benefit. We see it also in Q1 some benefit. It right now looks pretty stable. Having said that, there's, as you also know, there's a, a number of commodities out there which still are subject to wide variation. I mean, right now, it's, if you're trying to buy glass, glass is impacted by, by lithium, et cetera, which has higher spot prices. So there's a couple of smaller items which impact us in total, not that much, but there's still um, moving elements. And, and that always drives a certain amount of uncertainty. If you completely zoom out, Sam, and, and you've observed us for many years, of a total 800 to 900, given where we are in the year, um, I would say we we have right now a 70 to 80 percent fill rate, quote unquote, of our actions, which is actually pretty high compared to other years. So we feel, as we sit here today, with a high degree of confidence, we will hit these 800 to 900 million dollars. Yeah, Sam. Maybe just to add a little bit to what what Mark says is, you know, some of that confidence comes from many of these are due to actions we executed during 2022. Um, and so we're already beginning to see that in our, our exit run rate. Um, and then additionally, you know, if you look at the uh, the material environment, and as Mark said, this is our, our best estimate right now, but over the last couple of years in a volatile environment, we've been pretty good at, at putting an estimate around what we think materials will do for the year. So, um, you know, we feel good about all of those numbers. Your next question comes from the line of Mike Reho from J.P. Morgan. Your line is open. Uh, thanks. Uh, good morning, everyone. Um, morning. First, I, I'd love to dive in a little bit to the assumptions you're making in 2023 for Insincorator. Um, I know that, uh, you know, for sometimes in prior, you know, acquisitions, divestitures, you sometimes have been a little more hesitant to, to break out, you know, the impact of acquisitions. But, you know, given the, you know, $3 billion um, you know, purchase price, I think would be really helpful for for investors to understand, you know, what the contribution is expected in 2023 on, you know, sales and margins and, you know, you know, on a quarterly basis in, you know, the upcoming year to kind of give us a sense of how the acquisition is doing, I think would be very, very helpful. Yeah, Mike, this is Jim. And maybe I'd start with, you know, 
when we acquired Insincorator, we talked about it having, you know, revenues above 600 million, and we expect it to, to continue in that range and, and continue to grow it. We've, you know, said that the margins are above our average and very strong margins, and we expect that on a total basis. We think, you know, net of interest and everything, but with the tax benefits, it gives us about a dollar of additional EPS as we go into 2023. But it also gives us $100 million plus of free cash flow. And that's the good thing about this business. And part of the reason why we bought it is a very consistent performer, but also a very consistent generator of cash. And so, you know, that's what we expect right now headed into 2023 based on, on you know, what we've seen in our first two months of ownership. And Michael, it's, it's Mark, just to add to this one, um, you know, it's now two or three months where we have ownership of this one. I would say, first of all, from an environment, you know, it's um, integrated plays in the same kitchen as we have our major appliances. So the, the same external environment, which we described earlier, also applies to that segment. So the demand environment for the first half will be soft, and we expect them to pick up in the back half. Having said all that, um, the most important thing be um, this is a high margin business, and we saw very impressive stability and sustainability of the margins, um, both in the first two months or last two months of 22 and the first month of 23. So March look very good. And then more from an operational perspective, there is a, a major, and in this segment, you don't have product innovations every year, but there's a major generational product innovation coming in April, May. Um, and honestly, from the outside, I never thought you could be excited about garbage disposal, but I did. Um, so that is, that is a very, very exciting product, which comes out in April, May brings us not only higher consumer benefits, um, but also a further cost reduction on this one. So we feel very strong about this business from a structural run rate, um, from a product pipeline, um, and in particular once the housing picks up, which it will do at one point, we will really like this business. Okay, uh, appreciate it. Um, I guess secondly, uh, you know, you, you gave out guidance, I believe, saying that you know, 35 to 40 percent of your earnings would be in the first half. Um, when I look at you know slide 16, and I see that um, you know you're not going to have the the benefits really start until you know 2Q in terms of the uh, cost takeout and raw material benefits, but you do have first quarter being kind of flattish year over year. Um, how should I think about? first quarter uh, EBIT or margins versus, you know, fourth quarter, if you're not having any incremental headwinds, um, should we expect to see any type of significant improvement on a margin basis sequentially? Um, and then I think also lastly, I just want to make sure I heard right, you talked about North America being at 14% by the end of the year. I'm just not sure if, if you're intending to say that all else equal, that could be a starting point for 2024. I know you're not talking about 2024 yet, but uh, just making sure I understand that 14% comment correctly. Yeah, Michael, this is Jim, and I'll I'll get started. Then I'll let you know Mark kind of add to it. But if you if you look at the seasonality and and what you're referencing on slide 16, what you have to remember in the first quarter of the year is one. We have a higher cost layer of inventory right now that's just in, if you think about, you know, when we have close to two months of inventory on hand, that'll work through our system through the first quarter, and then we begin to realize the benefit of the lower material cost um, as you exit Q1 and into Q2. So your, your question on sequential margin improvement, yes, we expect to see that. Second is, as I mentioned, many of our cost uh, reduction programs were put in place in, in 2022, but we continue to put more in place in early 2023. So you'll see a ramp up of the additional cost savings beyond materials that will help the margin. So, you know, again, as we looked at and said, we think about 35 to 40% of the earnings comes in the first half of the year. And then those are the big drivers that, that take it out, uh, you know, later in the year. We also expect the demand environment to be a little bit more negative year over year in the first half of the year, and then more stable on a year over year basis in the second half of the year. To your, your question on, on the, the NAR margins too, if you think about you know, the, the different things we've talked about, whether it's the material cost, that does have a significant impact on NAR. So we do expect those margins to ramp up throughout the year. Additionally, in the first quarter, you have a small tail of just dealing with some of the issues we had in Q4 that we now say are behind us, but they were resolved in January. So, you know, that also will have an impact on the NAR margins in Q1, but then it begin to improve throughout the year. 
So, so, so Michael, let me make just specifically add in the North American margins. Um, and of course, the North American margins may drive a company margins. Um, as, as you rightfully pointed out, you know, on, on a full year base, you know, last year we had 11.5% margin in North America, and we now guide towards 12%. So, on full year base, it doesn't look like a big move. But given the, the volatility we all experienced the last couple of years, um, right now it's probably more of a sequential view, which makes sense as opposed to year over year. So, on a sequential base, we had in Q4 5.8%, which we always said are not representative of our structural run rates. Um, the important thing is what Jim alluded to we had two specific elements in our Q4 margin. One was still the tail end of a production reduction, which we explained in the last earnings call, and two was this one of supply issue. Um, put a number behind these ones, that's roughly about $100 million profit impact. So by definition, you should have the absence of this one in Q1. Um, so add this to the margin which we had in Q4, and then you probably get to a margin of 8 plus percent. Um, to be clear, this is not a guidance, but that's what you should expect, and, and that's what we would expect from our internal run rate. So you will see sequentially a significant margin expansion in Q1, and then throughout the year, as the raw material benefits start kicking in, as we explained on page 16, every quarter we would see a sequential margin improvement with an exit run rate, which is then getting much closer again to our long-term value creation targets. Your next question comes from the line of Liz Suzuki from Bank of America. Your line is open. Great, thank you. Um, I'm just curious what um, your relationship with your retail customers um, look like today, just given you know the disruption in the fourth quarter, and um, you know have, has Whirlpool lost shelf space to uh, you know to other brands, and then how do you get that back? Are there built is there a built-in backlog? Like were there contracts with retailers that you, know, you can now fulfill those um, you know, those orders or how should we think about the market share regain um, in, in 2023 in your assumption? So, so Liz, um, let me particular, I guess this question relates particularly to North America or US, so let me respond particularly to US. Um, in Q4, we had a market share which was pretty much identical to the Q3 market share. As a reminder, Q3, we picked up sequential market share, so we made a little bit of progress but we did not further expand that progress in Q4, but basically held it stable. Honestly, internally, we expected share gain. Um, and again, we're coming back to the supply constraint which we had in Q4. So we do expect in Q1 and then also subsequently margin, our sequential, not only margin, but also market share gains. Um, and that's what we kind of right now plan and what we see right now also happening in January. Um, particular to the relationship with retail, first of all, as for particular for US, you always got differentiated between builder um, and traditional retail. The builder side, as you as we probably explained, over the last years, not just the last year, we made tremendous progress on expanding our market share. We're now well above 50% in that segment. By definition, that segment is right now um, suppressed because we have a kind of a housing issues and the housing constraints in, in Q3 and Q4. Um, but at one point, that will fully benefit us. On the traditional retail side, as of today, we have not lost floor space. Um, but it's also clear, you know, we we got to provide our retailers with the products which we can sell. We have a lot of fantastic innovations um, launched and in the pipeline, um, be it the Maytech PET program, the two-in-one top load or the dishwasher, which is a brand new architecture. So we know we can sell more. Uh, we know it's floored, um, and we will we will fulfill that supply need. Great, thank you. Your next question comes from a line of Mike Dahl from RBC Capital Markets. Your line is open. Good morning, thanks for taking my question. Um, Mark, uh, Jim, I, I appreciate all the color so far. Uh, you know, if we look back at the last six months, I think it's taught everyone that, you know, visibility can be challenging. It's a quickly changing environment. When we look out at the housing landscape today, a single family permit is down 40% year on year. Home sales are down in the mid 30s still. Home prices have started to soften. These are all leading indicators, right? And, and so I guess I'm wondering, you know, I understand your long term views on, on housing, but I guess the question is, you know, why the conviction that all these headwinds will be behind you by the end of the first half of this year? 
Yeah, so, so Michael, I can probably address in particular the U.S. housing side. Um, as we said before, U.S. housing, we don't expect a major uplift in the first six months of this year. However, the long term and the even kind of probably post-summer, I do expect and see some recovery. First of all, you got to differentiate two elements, the existing home sales and the new home construction. The existing home sales, just if you look at the numbers, the last um, couple of months kind of fell from a run rate of more than 6 million to now slightly below 4 million. A slightly below 4 million, I mean, you got to go back several decades to see such a low level, um, which is below any sustainable run rate. And it's probably effect of ultimately mortgage rate shocks, um, coupled with high home prices. So what you earlier said as, as a leading indicator, home price starting coming down, that is actually the long-term good news for existing home sales because at one point it will improve home price affordability. Also, if you look at the mortgage rate, um, for those people who observed for over a no longer time, last year we had the highest spread between um, mortgage rates and 30-year treasury bonds. Um, that is unusually high, and most people would expect that spread to come down. So even though the Fed rates may not come down, um, there's reason to believe that the mortgage rates will stabilize and get back to their long-term historic spreads. So we do expect that home, or pro home affordable, housing affordability will improve as the year progresses, and that will ultimately trigger existing home sales. On the new home construction, many of the same factors apply. But the most important thing, I mean, right now, and you can talk to multiple industry sources, if you look at the last 10, 15 years, most people would agree there's about a 3 million unit undersupply of new homes. Um, that is about a two year supply at normal run rate. So at one point, that supply will be triggered. Okay. Will it all happen in 23? No. And it also will not happen entirely in 24. Um, but it's been, if you go back from history, probably ever since the housing market has been reported, um, this is probably the longest stretch of undersupply this market has experienced um, and will not last forever. Yeah, Mike, I'd say the, the other thing to add in there is you have to remember that our industry is, is a large replacement industry and about 55% of our business is replacement. And if you go back to the industry in 2011 was declining, in 2012 it was pretty much flat, but in 2013 you started to see some significant growth as it rebounded. And so when you look back 10 years, we're really now entering that period where you could have a, some very favorable replacement trends that are, that are underlying. Additionally, you know, if you look at, at what consumers are doing today, as, as you know, many consumers may not be moving, do they want to stay in their homes with their existing low mortgage rates? It does lead to more remodels. Um, and many of the times the kitchen is, is one of the things they remodel. So, you know, there are other trends out there that, that we do see that, that can be and will be positive for us. Got it. Um, okay. And, and again, I appreciate that. I think some of those things are probably debates rather than absolutes and timing still seems like a question from, from our standpoint. So the follow up, um, I think from my side would be, it seems like by the second half of the year, you're, you're assuming that industry volumes get closer to flat. It seems like for your own uh, volume assumptions, there's, there's an assumption for a share gain, so potentially a little volume growth that'll help drive uh, some of the year-on-year -year favorability in, in margin as the year progresses. So if, if the demand side doesn't come through as is expected in the second half, how should we think about um, you know, margin impacts or decrementals, um, you know, given there's obviously a lot of moving pieces around the cost side as well? So if we're trying to isolate kind of the volume side and how that plays into it, um, how should we be thinking about that? So, so Michael, maybe it's just, and again, we are only talk about North America right now. We, in on this page 19 on our presentation, we guide or our assumption for the market is minus six to minus four on North America on a full year base. Um, keep in mind that comes on top of a 6.5% down in 22. So to Jim's earlier point, at one point, you just reach a floor of what is replacement market. Replacement markets are right now already 55%. So the pieces which can move, i.e. the discretionary purchase, at one point you're in such a low level that the, a further downside risk is realistically fairly small. I would say from today's perspective, if at all, I would more see upside risk, even though I wouldn't probably call it risk, but right now it's, there's, there's a lot of arguments to be made by it will start recovering. To your earlier point about, yeah, we can all argue about the timing of a slow consumer recovery. 
it doesn't change the fact that the mid and long term fundamentals are strong ones. And that just, you know, people want to bet against the US housing market. So be it. Um, we do believe that the long term US housing market is a very strong one and will fully recover. Your next question comes from the line of Susan McClary from Goldman Sachs. Your line is open. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Good morning, Please. Susan. Mark, my my first question is, given your background and experience operationally with the business in various regions that have faced different challenges over time, how do you think about the North American operations today, the opportunities there, and, and the opportunity to hit some of those initiatives that you outlined in your comments? Yes, Susan, I think that's obviously a very macro question with a, with a pretty big time horizon, but I would actually come back all the way to our decisions and, and what we plan with our portfolio transformation. Um, I am a firm believer in the long-term fundamentals of North and South America, coupled with an exceptionally strong market position, which we have in both parts of the world. Um, so will the North America market go for some cycles, which are larger driven? Yeah, because we're still living in a post-COVID world and in the interest rate shock, yes. It doesn't change my fundamental perspective about the long-term health of this market, the long-term health of our position in the market, and our ability to deliver very strong margins in the market. Um, and we will deliver it and we will demonstrate it. But again, it's um, I've been observing, well, I was responsible for North America ever since 2008 or 2009, so I've seen the ups and downs of this housing market. I, I, I think I have pretty good access to one or two of the numbers of the housing market. You can't ignore the market that has been undersupplied for 15 years, but at one point it will recover. Um, because the one thing interest rates don't impact are demographics, okay? And the demographics in North American household formation is solid, and there's quite a bit of pent-up demand. So I know I'm repeating myself in, in that optimism, but um, Susan, that explains why I'm fundamentally bullish on the mid- and long-term prospects of North America. Yeah, okay. I appreciate that. And then, you know, one of the things that we've seen in some of the other product categories that are promotionally driven or, or can be exposed to more promotions is that given the demand dynamics of the last two years, they're just not necessarily having the same effect on the consumer as they did pre-COVID. Would you say that you're seeing something similar in your industry? And is that impacting how you think of the level and the range of promotions and incentives we could see this year relative to the pre-COVID norms? I think, I think Susan, you, you're raising a, a very good question or observation. Um, and, and I just comment now on the hindsight, because as, as, as always, we, we don't comment too much on the I mean, promotion plans or whatever going forward. But on hindsight, so kind of in particular, as you look at 22, I think the traditional way how we would have looked at responsiveness to promotion or price elasticity has somewhat changed. Um, through COVID and, and, and also in this post-COVID world, and in particular in an environment where replacement market had such a big share um, because of the fact that discretionary part is much smaller by definition what you can tap into with promotions is smaller um, the replacement market in its own historically is not very by definition not very responsive to promotion um, because people replace the product when it needs to be replaced so so that probably explains what you described where traditional responsiveness in the market to promotions is maybe less when it was in a pre-COVID environment. And again, in our case, that's largely driven by a much higher share of replacement market. Your next question comes from a line of Eric Bassard from Cleveland Research. Your line is open. Uh, good morning. Two, uh, two things. First of all, on uh, the price mix, uh, you talked about the second half of 22, the promotions were as expected. Uh, there was a step down pretty meaningfully in price mix from what you targeted in the second half. And so what I'm curious about, I see you've guided it down 200 some basis points in 23. Uh, I'm curious within that, we're seeing retailers who accepted cost-based price increases on the way up now asking for a return of that as, as costs come down. Uh, I know you're also assuming a favorable mix, but it seems like there's some trade down going on with a bit more cautious consumer. And so the, the question is with that context, as you look at, that negative 200 or so basis point price mix in 23. Uh, what are the moving pieces and, and is there more upside or more downside to that? Um, would love some perspective on that. 
so, so Eric, um, first of all, as we look in 23, you got to keep in mind that you're lapping now against three rounds of price increases. So by definition, at one point, the, the positive price mix will, by definition, just go down to zero because you, you're comparing against prior year from um, significant increases. Um, what we have factored in is kind of promotional levels, which are similar to the levels which we've seen in the back of 22, so that's fully incorporated. Um, at the same time, we do strongly believe we in particular have mixed opportunities. Um, also, if you look at our Q4, um, and, and you guys know it from a, your operation perspective on our business, is um, the lack of supply which we had in Q4 didn't help us from a mixed side um, because the products which we particularly couldn't deliver were the non-promoted items and the high-value mixed items. So we do expect, in particular, as you come from Q4 into Q1, Q2, um, sequential improvement of mix, and that's our opportunity to protect um, pricing also as we look in 22, uh, 23, while of course taking into account that there will be a, a promotion environment similar to the back half of 22. So again, there are several factors playing into role. Um, this is a highly competitive environment and, and, and I think we took the reasonable assumption in this. And so then a second question for, for, for Jim, uh, on slide seven, uh, pretty compelling from a value creation, the, the divestitures and the portfolio changes that add up to, I think, about a billion dollars, uh, which is the present value of future cash flows. I'm curious what the math on that slide would be if you look at uh, the current level performance of the businesses, not the future anticipated improvement. What, is, what does that look like if we took a snapshot of it today? Yeah, I, I mean, if if you took a snapshot today, and and maybe if I I kind of roll back and say, you know, as we went through this process, we looked at multiple alternatives and cases, and we looked at, um, you know, from if we keep the business and the improvements we would make, we would make, and what investments that would require, we we had different types of potential buyers, and then we looked at the strategic partnership, and what I would say is this had the highest return of any of those options that we had out there. And, you know, as, as I said, the reason for that, even on an internal type of option, is that would have required a significant amount of upfront cash investment from us. Um, and while it would have allowed us to improve the margins, that upfront cash investment would still give it a lower net present value. Now, the other thing is by keeping a 25% stake in this business, it allows us to participate in that upside, which we do believe can be significantly more than we could have generated on our own. And so that's really where, when you look at this transaction, the value creation comes from. And, you know, Mark talked about this earlier in some of his remarks, is the opportunity that we have to participate and then potentially at some point in time realize or monetize that part of the business. But we do, we do believe in the long-term health of that business, uh, you know, in this partnership. So give me a word. I think this was the last question which we covered today. So let me just close up and and wrap up here. Um, first of all, thanks for joining us here today. Um, obviously, there is a lot of moving parts, but I still want to remind of two critical items. One is what you just alluded to is a, a transaction in Europe. We, April last year, we said we will do a strategic review in Europe. Um, I think as you heard from Jim, we looked at all the options. We strongly believe this is the most value creating option of all which we looked at. Um, and it creates the strongest business going forward. So we feel very good that we step we will be doing uh, and now we kind of signed a significant step obviously that still needs to be closed um, which we expect sometime around q3 on the underlying operating business outside europe um, you also heard before that in the particular second half of 22 yes we had an unfavorable environment um, because it's very historically it's somewhat unusual to have demand down and cost up typically these kind of situations don't last very long and as you heard from us, we don't expect that to last for the entire 23. Um, there still will be some, some carryover into Q1, um, but when we do expect improvement. But beyond hoping or betting on an extra environment, you saw us, we're taking strong actions. Um, the 800 to 900 million cost target is the one which you need to hold us accountable for, um, because that is ultimately the fuel um, of a driver behind our, our guidance, which we've given for 23. So with that, um, Looking forward to talk to you either at the next earnings call or in respective conferences in between. So thanks again for joining us. Ladies and gentlemen, that concludes our fourth quarter 2022 Whirlpool Corporation Earnings Conference Call. You may now disconnect. <laughs>